Arne is the uh, founded Gaimon, the uh, eclosure consulting company, and works as its CEO. He teaches and consults about all things closure and closure script. And Daniel basically wrote the book. It's a very good book. book. <laughs> closure for the brave and true. That's I enjoyed right. it very much. <laughs> so please give a loud applause, applause to our next speakers. <laughs> all right. All right. Hey, everyone. Good energy in the crowd. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, well, as we just said, I'm Daniel. And my name is Arna. And this is our talk, Beginner Driven Development. And to kick things off, we want to throw a little thought exercise at you. Ask yourself this question. What if closure was the most beginner-friendly language on the planet? What would change? What would that look like? So if closure was the most beginner-friendly language on the planet, then I think it stands to reason that more people would learn closure. They would be drawn to it because it's just, you know, so accessible. Um, and it would become accessible to people whom it's currently not accessible to. It would also probably mean that Clojure would be more people's first language. Like, people who are you know, not programming yet, it, it could be something that helps them get into programming for starters. And, I mean, let's be honest, it would also just be good for all of us. You know, like we all have days where things, you know, it's like it's just not really clicking or we're like fighting some tooling or whatever. So like, Beginner-friendly is not only for beginners. Like it, it really helps all of us, too. These are great points, Arna. I agree with all of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, being able to program is this incredible gift. It almost feels like magic. It's empowering in so many different ways. And part of what's exciting to me about this idea of closure begin being beginner-friendly is that we can provide more opportunity for people. When you learn to program, you get access to better jobs. And for me personally, this is exciting because this has been my experience. This is my story. When I was, <laughs> when I, when I was growing up, like, my family was poor. My mom was a single parent. She was a refugee, but she wanted a better life for her kids. And so she encouraged me to learn programming, and I liked it, and I stuck with it. And like, now I get to be here in Berlin with all y'all. And so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, to me, this is like... This is amazing, and the idea that we can have this kind of impact on people, like, we could really change people's lives by making this more accessible. Oh, and this photo, just by the way, this is from my uh, childhood uh, Lisp induction ceremony. I think <laughs> everyone had one of those, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah, and so there's another related reason why we want to make closure this very beginner-friendly language. Because if you think about it, like, what, what would the opposite mean? Like, the opposite of beginner-friendly, you could say, is expert-focused, right? Like, a language really for experts. And then, if you think about it, like, if most experts, programming experts, are making good bank, so if you're a low-income person, you're probably not yet a programming expert. So we're kind of excluding, almost by definition, low-income people. And so, you know, it's really interesting to think about, like, okay, you know, which other groups on the planet might be, be excluding by sort of having these, these artificial barriers in place. Um, and so we want people who aren't experts yet and who don't have the same background as experts to feel like they also belong in our spaces, to feel like they can be part of this community. And so, um, you know, we don't want to just focus on people who are like already programmers or people in college, which is like often the, the first thing people think about uh, when they think about beginners. It's like, okay, you know, like people who are studying it or whatever. But there's, there's a lot of other people out there with different, you know, different angles they're coming from. Um, and so if we work to make programming beginner-friendly, then we can reduce or remove the barriers that place this gift out of reach for these people. We can meaningfully improve people's lives. We can continue creating an environment where everyone feels like they belong, because you shouldn't have to be an expert to have a shot at becoming an expert. Wow, that's, like, that's a really good way to put it. I think it's really pithy. Um, so, so far, we've been talking about, you know, pr actually more like programming in general, like, like making programming more beginner-friendly in general. But we're here for closure. Why make closure more beginner-friendly? And I think that we can start to answer that question by looking at some of the efforts that have been released in the last few years that make it way more beginner-friendly. Those include Calva, Portal, CLJ Condo. What's interesting about these is that they've only been released recently. And for me, it's like they hint at the untapped potential of Clojure as a beginner-friendly language. It makes you wonder, like, what else is out there waiting to be invented? Um, I also I do want to give a special shout-out to uh, Borgtude. Um, uh, 
<laughs> Building slowly but sure, like, well, not even slowly, quickly and surely, what I like to call the Borkiverse. This is his uh, Infinity Gauntlet. We don't know what will happen with the, if he snaps his fingers. Um, some say that maybe half the parentheses in the world will disappear, but uh, so let's uh, you know, support him on GitHub sponsors, keep him happy. Yeah, and so we think that Clojure has this amazing potential to be a, an introductory language, to be a language to get people into programming. Um, you know, because it's a language that, that really learns from a lot of stuff that came before it, and that lets you focus on real problems. You know, not just like uh, boilerplate and, and obsolete concepts that, that maybe then you'll unlearn later in your career. Like, basically, if this is what you start with, it gives you this huge leg up. And so um, closure is created by experts, and that's, that's great, you know, like that's why we're all here, that's why we love it so much, because it really embodies a lot of these ideas that people have thought about long and hard, and it avoids a lot of obsolete ideas. And so if you start with closure, there's, there's basically less to unlearn. And so we think, you know, like putting closure in that position as that beginner-friendly, you know, like starting language can have a really big positive impact on the world. In order to get there, we think that this needs to be a community effort. Uh, our community, the Clojure community, is defined by a shared set of values. This includes you know, functional programming, a commitment to stability, simplicity, things like this. And we want to add to this, this focus on beginner friendliness and accessibility. So like, this, is part, like, this is really why we're here today, to, to try to enlist your help and get you on board with this idea. Yeah, and so, so in order to do that, in order to uh, you know, get, get community buy-in, we, we kind of need to talk about the, the elephant in the room because we think that one of the hurdles to this kind of community buy-in is actually the word itself, right? The word easy. Like, it's somewhat become almost like a dirty word in the closure community. You know, we care about things being like simple and elegant and, you know, decomplected and what have you. Um, but, but like easy, it's like, it's almost not serious to talk about, you know, like, well, is something easy? Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I also, I understand where that comes from, right? Like, I've also been, like, in those conversations. And um, there's a lot of complexity has come from, you know, pursuing, like, a certain type of easiness. But, but saying that because of that, easy doesn't have value is, is throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Because arguably, like, the whole point of programming is making things easier. Like, we, we want to reduce effort, we want to reduce discomfort, like, that's what easy means. You know, we create tools that provide leverage, we make it easier for people to do their jobs. And we make it easier for ourselves to do our jobs, you know, we create tools and libraries so that we can, you know, more easily do the stuff we do. If we didn't do that, we'd still be writing assembly on punch cards. So, you know, you'll often hear, hear closure people talk about simple and then, like, it's opposite, complex or complected. But why do we care about simple? It's because simple makes things easy. You know, like if, if a system or a program is simple, it's easier to learn, it's easier to change, it's easier to compose with other things. And so that's, you know, like, why do we care about simple? It's because of easy. Right, so yeah, if we're gonna make closure a, a more beginner-friendly language, we want to make it easier to learn, easier to use. But we want to do it in a way that still is closure, that pres preserves this emphasis on simplicity. We want to do a good easy, and we want to avoid bad easy. So um, one way that you can think about this is like, we want to avoid doing stuff like this. What's, what's this, Daniel? Is oh. this a slide you just put in? Or? Or, or, well, actually, this is a, a butter dispenser. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, this makes it a lot easier to dispense that's, your that's butter. That's amazing. Very common kitchen task, dispensing butter. This is going to revolutionize my life. It makes it a lot easier. Well, no, actually, I think that, you know, maybe a butter dispenser is like maybe the bad kind of easy, right? It makes maybe this one task easier, but does it make the whole cooking experience easier? I'd say that that's pretty doubtful. Instead, we want to create tools like this, a blender. Blenders actually make things easier. They make it possible to do things you couldn't before, and manual tasks become easier, too. So this is the kind of ease that we're striving for, right? Um, but there's still the question of how do we do this? We can't claim to be experts on this subject, but we do have some ideas. And what we want to do is provide a lens through which you can look at this challenge. Indeed. And that lens that we want to provide is just this concept of usability. Right? So usability is basically a person's experience as they are using a product. 
And as they are doing that, they need to complete certain tasks, they want to accomplish certain goals. And so by looking at those individual tasks, at those individual goals, we can kind of get a perspective of, you know, like how hard or easy is this thing. And if you look at it that way, then that also shows that, um, you know, this is, this is a function not just of, you know, say the core language, but it's really an entire ecosystem of, you know, like libraries, tools, educational resources, documentation, right? Like that whole experience is, is you know, what you're doing day to day. That's the development life cycle. It's not just gen generic lines of code that you're crunching out. Yeah, so some examples of these kinds of tasks that we perform uh, when we're doing programming are looking up docs and writing tests and debugging. Like when you're talking about making programming easier, like that's not actually the level at which you can evaluate whether or not something is easy. You can't evaluate programming at whole, as a whole. You have to break it down into these um, subtasks that we engage in like day in and day out. And to evaluate them, you can ask yourself questions that you can pull from the world of usability, like how discoverable is this thing if you're building some tool? How easy is it to, to find the tool, right? Um, if your system is providing feedback, how useful is that feedback? And I think we've seen actually a couple of talks already that talk about this idea. And another question that you can ask is, how many steps does it take, right? This is just like a really easy way to evaluate the work involved, you know, with, uh, you, to use the thing that you're building or to learn the thing that you're building. Right. So again, just to emphasize, this is like that when we look at these tasks, it is about the whole ecosystem. This is not like a, a kind of roundabout way to get like a Jira ticket onto the you know <laughs> core, core team's Jira board. Um, this is really talking about like the the entire ecosystem uh, that we engage with as Clojureists and about the the perception that we can create by uh, adopting these ideas. Oh, oh. Arno. Arno. I is this another slide you put in this morning? I, hadn't, I didn't see this one yet. <laughs> yeah, actually, I was pretty excited to find this. This is a pickle picker. Has anyone, does anyone ever have uh, problems picking their pickles out of their pickle jars? Yeah. It's a real problem, right? Yeah, we see some hands. Yeah, it's like it's a real, yeah, it's a real pain, but this lets you uh, pick your pickle. That is, and I was, I was like using forks like a, like a caveman. This is, this is amazing. Yeah, you can get rid of all your forks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. Oh, okay, this is my turn again. All right, so... So, um, wait a minute. No, it's still your turn. Is it my turn? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so this, the pickle picker is a good illustration of, like, you know, characterizing bad easy versus good easy. Like, bad easy is this, like, you know, you make, you make a single task easier, but you're creating long-term difficulty. I mean, it's like, okay, every metaphor breaks down, but in the end, you know, you have, like, a kitchen full of single-use tools, and, you know, like, you can't, you can't, find the thing you're looking for anymore. You don't get anything done anymore. And so a concrete example could be, you know, like maybe you can like generate a whole CRUD app with a one-liner, but then it actually like introduces long-term difficulty maintaining and evolving that app. And so bad easy is often done by taking like, you know, like this really clever, complex, complicated code and then trying to pave it with this like easy to use you know top level layer like oh you know like mm -hmm. here's here's the the API for mortals, and what that does is, is it does is, is creates this this divide this barrier where it's like okay you know like you're not supposed to touch the internals like that's for the elite that's for you know like the the people in the know, you know if you do look at it you might run away scared from what you find there. Uh, and so it, it creates this barrier beyond which, like, it gets very hard to understand things, debug things, uh, a barrier for participation, you know, mm -hmm. like, you're hard to, to, like, get involved with that code. And so it, it becomes almost a barrier of helplessness, you know, like, you can, you can use this API, but, but, you know, like, don't, don't dig deeper, that's not, that's not where you're supposed to be. And is that what we mean when we say we want to make Clojure the most beginner-friendly language on the planet? Obviously not. So when looking at these tasks, we can see that there are ways to make closure easier to learn and use without creating, without creating butter dispensers and pickle pickers. In fact, sometimes, you know, it's not even about design trade-offs. Like, you might now have this, this sense that we're saying, like, oh, you know, like, sometimes you can sacrifice some simplicity and elegance for making things easier. And, and sometimes that's the case, but actually, often, if you look well enough, you'll find that you can accomplish both and get a better design overall. All right, yeah, so let's actually dig into some of the specific tasks 
that you encounter as programmers. And one task that we are always engaged in all the time is the task of learning. Right? You have to learn new systems, you have to learn new tools all the time. If you, when like, building your tool, building your system, invest in learnability, this page pays huge dividends over time. Like for open source projects, it helps improve adaptability, right? Like within your organization, if you pay attention to learnability, this makes your organization more resilient to personnel changes. You know, if people leave, like the experts in your, your organization leave, or you, you bring on new people, you know, it's, it's, you're better able to get people up to speed and you can avoid situations where it's like it's harder to get work done or you might run into some emergency and no one knows how to address it. So by focusing on learnability, you know, you can uh, make your, your organization more resilient. And uh, this is, in case y'all are wondering, this is, um, this is a slide from like, it's this little known documentary called The Matrix. And it's like, <laughs> it's, like it's, it's showing, it really shows the benefits of like, you know, putting, putting work into to making learnability easier. This guy, he learned Kung Fu like pretty much instantly. It was pretty wild. It was like, it was like a multi-part documentary. Just, you probably want to watch the first part. <laughs> Yeah, and so when we're talking about you know learnability, it really starts like to give a concrete example, and this is a topic dear to my heart. It's like readmes, and so for instance, for an open source project, you know the readme is basically the the human interface, like someone who's you know like stumbles upon your project, you know maybe through googling or maybe a colleague was like, hey, you know you need to check this thing out, right? Like they're gonna start with a readme, and so a really good exercise is just like trying to take that person's perspective, you know, open, open your project on GitHub and just read through the readme top to bottom and sort of like think about, okay, you know, like that person who's like stumbled upon this doesn't really know exactly what it is yet. You know, like are they, are they getting their answers? So the first thing you probably want to do is like situate them, you know, give them some context. Like what, what does this library try to accomplish? What, what were sort of the, the, the design forces that, that caused the author to say, oh, this, you know, this needs to exist. What are the design trade-offs? You know, these kind of things. And then once you get past that and people are like, oh, yeah, this actually sounds like what I need, you know, then it's like step two, you know, like do they have to wait through, you know, like dependency hell and, you know, figure out, oh, you know, what do I, what do I need for inputs to be even, uh, even able to call this? Or are there like some concrete examples and they can just jump into a REPL and, you know, like within a minute or two, they can kind of start seeing what it does. Uh, and then the on-ramp from there, you know, like to the docs, et, et cetera. For in-house projects, it's actually not that different. Like, I don't know if like, if you're working on, you know, like an in-house code base, I guess most of them tend to have readmes these days too, right? Like raise your hand if your project has a readme. Uh, keep it up if you feel like your readme is being kept up to date well. <laughs> <laughs> So that's a big difference, right? And so like whenever a new colleague joins, they're going to start with that readme and it can mean that they're up to speed in a day or that they need to pair for two days with someone to, to get up to speed. And then if there's like, you know, maybe someone doesn't really touch the front end much, but then one day they do, you know, they're going to go back to that readme and sort of try to figure out what the flow is for that. So, you know, this, this is important stuff. All right. Yeah, so the overall idea here is you know, removing barriers for people so that they can, they can participate, that they, ca they can use your tool, they can learn it and be productive with it, right? So even if you do write a readme, there are ways that you can um, inc uh, introduce barriers within the readme. You can, for example, use unfamiliar terminology. Um, you can make assumptions about someone's, uh, about someone's background and experience level. And, you know, easy way to deal with this is just to, like, define your terms, especially if they're, like, the more jargony they are. You can provide links on this great thing called the internet to other explanations for how things work. Right? So, so um, in general, like this mindset of like, okay, like what are the barriers here that are keeping people from participating? I think keeping that in mind will allow us to produce uh, better documentation and learning materials. Yeah. Oh, Arna, oh. what's this? Oh, Daniel, you haven't seen this one yet? So, I don't know, maybe you were still cracking your eggs like by hand, basically. I have been like, cracking it. I've been using these stupid uh, things to crack yeah. my hands. So, so, you know, like, this is, this is an egg cracker. Like, it revolutionizes your, your whole egg cracking experience. Wow, does it have Bluetooth? Uh, well, yeah, it... it <laughs> I, I just got one the other day, and, and it did, did take half a day to run the updates, but okay. then after that, it runs great. Like, oh, yeah, like, hey Siri, use it, hey Siri with it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Hey Siri, crack my eggs. That's amazing. 
Do you have these for sale? Did you bring them with you in your suitcase? Uh, yeah, I'll be. You can come back to stage later. It's only fifteen fifty-four, and then. Uh, Should we'll, we just we'll skip the rest of this talk and talk about air crackers? <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, let's not talk about air crackers. Let's talk about observability. So, optimizing for observability and inspectability is another great thing you can do to make code more beginner friendly. So we, we as closure programmers, we live in a REPL driven world. And what that really means is that, you know, you can take stuff apart. You can sort of go expression by expression, see what the inputs are, see what outputs you get back. And that, that works because a lot of the stuff is just pure data, you know, like you evaluate it, you see what it is, uh, you, can, you can write it in your code as a, as a literal, et cetera. And so you can take off the back plate and kind of see how things tick. But things get a lot harder if, uh, you know, A, you need a lot of context, right? Like, oh, you need all these dynamic bindings in place before you can evaluate this thing. Or, you know, this whole system needs to be running before you can evaluate this thing. Or maybe you're, like, you have, like, opaque values, you know, like objects that aren't really inspectable. Or just have a lot of coupling where it's like, okay, you know, like you need this thing in order to have that thing. And it's kind of hard to like look at things in isolation. And so all of that kind of, you know, that, that great REPL workflow we have where you can sort of like poke at things and kind of figure it out step by step can make that a lot harder. And as, as a dynamic language, and especially as a Lisp, we have this property which uh, Martin Fowler dubbed internal reprogrammability. So we, we work inside a process. Like we can change and you know like inspect and redefine everything in there, and that's really a superpower. But some designs make this easy, and some designs make this hard. And so you know, over the last couple of years, uh, I've been working on various projects with the Next Journal folks, and it's been super inspiring because they really want to push the, these kind of visions forward. So there's a, a cloak workshop coming up, which I would attend if I wasn't teaching a workshop myself. I'm, I'm really excited about it. You know, these ideas of like that you can like on the fly define a viewer to look at certain data, like this is stuff that the small talk folks have had for decades. And, um, you know, tools like Clerk, but also Portal, you know, are like bringing that into our spaces now. And I, I think that's super exciting. Uh, another thing that like I have, you know, that's kind of close to my heart is just like good old logging. So I find that people kind of underappreciate the value of, of good logging. You know, like logging is not just a print line. If you want to inspect values, we have tools like Portal that are like really great for that. But where logging really shines is that, you know, if you have anything that's process based, you know, maybe it's like an event loop or like something with mm -hmm. timers or, you know, anything that sort of involves like stuff happening over time, your log is your narrative. You can kind of like read it as a story and see what's happening in your system. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's something that we can really leverage better. Yeah. I'm actually going to the clerk workshop. I hope we can still be friends. <laughs> Get you a tickle picker to make up for it. All right. So when we're talking about logging, logging is an instance of feedback. And actually, all the, all the talks I think so far today have addressed feedback. And when you, your system is giving feedback, you want to think about the questions that the developer, like the user, is going to be asking when interacting with your system. Right? And the main questions are really, is this working or not? Sometimes it's not obvious that it's working. If it's not working, they want to know why it's not working and like, what to do to fix it. Right? So the more specific that you can get about this, the better an experience someone is going to have when interacting with your system. Right? And this, like, again, this is not just for beginners. This is for all of us. Right? So it's a, lot, it's a lot nicer to have uh, an assertion like, in your function that checks your arguments and throws an exception there rather than you know, having to wade through like, you know, 20, 30 dozen layers of stack traces to figure out like, what actually happened, what went wrong. Right? So just yeah, one, one really quick and easy thing, put in assertions for your arguments. What this shows us, <laughs> what this, what this shows us is that by focusing on beginner friendliness, this is actually not detrimental to the design of your system. This is actually, it can be a way to provide yourself with a forcing function, right, to improve the design of your system. You know, like the better your system communicates to beginners, it's going to communicate better to everyone. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so, I think we've, we've shown now like several ways in which you can make your, your code, your software, like both more beginner friendly and basically like a better design overall, sort of make it more inspectable, make it more fine grained, make it simpler, et cetera. So often, you know, like these, this, these two axes kind of go in the same direction. 
there are times when they, they go opposite directions. And I think especially this is relevant for tooling. Um, so this is a feature of Kaucha, uh, the closure test runner, where if, uh, if you run Kaucha and like, you know, it tries to scan your test path and it, it comes back empty, so it's like, okay, I didn't find any tests, then it gives you this hint, it's like, okay, these are like the most common reasons, because this is a very common thing that happens. And so we kind of give people a hint that like, oh, you know, like you might want to check these things. But features like this do add complexity, and so it means that there are like new places now where bugs can be hiding. Um, and so what, what happened at some point was that if you had a syntax error in a test file, that, you know, this is what it's supposed to look like. It's supposed to tell you, you know, like failed loading tests because there was an exception compiling, you know, in this file at this line and so forth. But what was actually happening is that this got swallowed and then Kaucha came back up and said, oh, you know, I wasn't able to load any tests. I have an empty test plan. You know, like maybe your test path is wrong. So that was like, you know, a supposed to be helpful feature that ended up being not helpful at all. Now we, we fixed this and I still think, you know, like having these kind of ergonomics in a tool like this makes sense. You know, we want to make testing as, as easy as possible, but it just kind of shows that like sometimes, you know, you get both and sometimes you do have to kind of choose where you are in that design space. Arna, can you, can you tell me about that? <laughs> yes. So it's a, it's a hot summer day and, um, you know, there's, there's some pretty good ice cream in Berlin, but the, the problem with ice cream is kind of a, a design flaw, a fundamental design flaw, is that, you know, you get a cone with a, with a, a ball of ice, a uh, scoop of ice on top, and, you know, you're licking on one side, and it, it just starts dripping onto your hand on the other side. Nightmare. It yeah. happens every time, right? So the, yeah. the trick is actually, I don't know if you noticed, like, to, like, spin it as, oh. as you're licking it. Did not know. But that's, you know, like... That's, that's a hard job, you know, like it's hot. We don't want to waste all those calories, you know, like spinning that ice cream cone. And so someone came up with this helpful design, a ice cream cone spinner. Awesome. Maybe we'll get to try it out here in a minute when yeah. we're uh, done with the talk. All right. Okay. All right. So starting to wrap things up here, um, some of y'all probably noticed that we've been hinting at this seminal talk uh, Rishiki gave, uh, simple, versus, uh, <laughs> simple Made Easy. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And so, so in it, like Rich, Rich talks about, you know, uh, these ideas of like how we, if we're, you know, focusing on simplicity, or I'm sorry, focusing on on easiness, then it can result in designs that are more complex and needlessly entangled, complected, you might say, right? And that calls a longer-term work for people, right? And so um, he also says in this talk that. You know, easiness is more of a subjective experience. It's like what's easy for me might not be easy for Arna or vice versa, right? Um, but we think that his main quarrel really is with this, uh, this idea that we've been calling bad, bad easy, right? And so what we uh, hope to do is show you that by breaking, breaking down the uh, whole activity of programming into these tasks, you can actually start evaluate the, evaluating them one-on-one -on -one and um, actually improve the ease of your system without impacting the design, and that uh, you can also evaluate this in a more objective way by asking questions like, how many steps is this? Yeah, I, I, that's a really good point. And as, as Rich uh, puts it on, on this slide himself, right, like the benefit of simplicity is ease of understanding, ease of change, easier debugging, and, and greater flexibility. And so in a, in a way, we're saying the same thing. But simple software, you know, in, in the, the hickey sense of simple, um, can still be inaccessible and confusing and hard to learn. And so, you know, what Rich is saying, and he's definitely not wrong, is that you don't want to ignore simplicity for the sake of making things easy. What we're saying is, okay, you know, don't also don't make the opposite mistake and ignore ease by focusing on simplicity. Yeah, so like this emphasis on simpli uh, simplicity has improved all of our lives, right? And I just think, you know, if we imagine how much more our own lives could improve if we focused on ease, it'd be incredible. And it would not just improve our lives, but again, like the lives of beginners, lives of people who are looking to get into this field and radically change their own lives. Yeah, and so it's worth noting that actually, like when you when when people talk about, you know, because this is this is part of the closure canon, right? Like this is like part of our you know, like our thought space. People sometimes seem to think that this talk is like simple versus easy, as if they're opposites. But, but Richard's talk is actually called Simple Made Easy. And we think that Clojure is uniquely poised to be a language that does that, that makes simple easy. And so we think that Clojure has the potential to become the most beginner-friendly language. 
We're really excited to try it, and we hope you all are too. Thank you. Thank you.